Well, welcome to this wonderful, wonderful Wacom Reads event. So tonight we welcome Michael Christie, a highly regarded Canadian author whose two novels, Greenwood and If I Fall, If I Die, and his linked collection of stories, The Beggar's Garden, were all long listed for the Scotiabank Giller Prize. I said that right this time. The third time's the charm. So think National Book Award for Canadians, the Scotia Giller. Scotia, oh, see, I got it wrong. It's, got it right the third time, not the fourth. The Scotia Bank Giller Prize is essentially like the National Book Award for Canadians. You may have also come across his essays and book reviews in such publications as the Globe and Mail, the Washington Post, and the New York Times. Before he was an author, Michael Christie worked in a homeless shelter and as a carpenter. He lives part-time in Victoria, BC, and the rest of the time on scenic Galliano Island with his wife and two children. He actually built his timber frame house himself. With its non-linear plot, arranged like the rings of an old growth Douglas fir, Greenwood takes us from 2038 to 1934 and back again tracing the lives of multiple members of the Greenwood family, founders and heirs to a vast timber empire that now contains some of the last trees to survive the great withering. So if you haven't read the book yet, I know you will, and I have no doubt that before Michael is done here tonight, you're going to rush right out and purchase one of them at the tables outside. So enough from me. Let me turn it over to Michael Christie. Please join me in welcoming our 2022 Wacom Reads author, Michael Christie. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. That was a lovely introduction. It's always very strange to hear your resume uh, spoken aloud to a theater, but uh, I appreciate it. Um, and thank you for being here. I can't see you, but I know you're there watching me, watching my every move. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here for many, many reasons. Um, and I first want to get some thank yous done because I know what an endeavor something like Wacom Reads is, and I just want to acknowledge that. So I just want to say thank you to Anne McCallan, uh, Mary Vermillion, and Michael Cox of the Whatcom County Library System. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you to Christina Kepi of Western Washington University, and thank you to Kelly Everett and Paul Hansen of Village Books, who have been trying to get me to Bellingham for two years. <laughs> and it's, it's very much appreciated, and I'm so happy to be here. Originally, I was uh, all scheduled to come uh, in February of 2020, uh, which was a great time to release a book. Um, <laughs> And uh, as you can imagine, I ended up on the clipper ship uh, outside on the deck uh, in the rain going home with my book tour canceled. So uh, this is much better. Uh, and I also want to say just thank you for coming tonight. I know that this is the sort of for early days of the loosening of restrictions and many of you maybe haven't been in an event like this before. So. I really appreciate you joining, joining me and, and, and being here. So, Greenwood, here it is. It's heavy, it's made of trees. There's no other way to do it. Um, it's really been a book that's been embraced uh, by folks in this area, not just in Bellingham, but in the wider community. And <clears throat> in a way that I, you know, find just wonderful and unexpected. Um, and earlier today, when I was preparing uh, for tonight, I did a little Google Maps scan around uh, uh, the theater, and I, I started noticing uh, a strange kind of significance, and I noticed uh, Beach Street, Pine Street, Cedar Street, Willow Street, Magnolia Street, and then also my favorite, 
Forest Street, which crosses Holly, Maple, and Chestnut. Uh, so clearly, um, you folks know your trees, and you live among them, and so you're, you're the perfect audience uh, for, for, me and, for me and my work. So tonight, uh, I'm going to do two readings, uh, shorter readings. I'm going to read a little bit from my essay that has been published in the wonderful uh, anthology Interconnectedness that we put together for this uh, Walk and Reads this year. And I'm also going to read a little bit, tiny bit, from Greenwood itself. Um, so uh, that it will be the structure. And then I'm really looking forward to taking your questions as well. So what is Greenwood? For those of you who haven't read it, it's a intergenerational family saga uh, that spans 140 years uh, that follows four different generations of the Greenwood family. Um, and it is structured, uh, narratively structured, like the rings of a tree. And so there's an index page at the beginning of the book that lays out uh, how the story is going to go. And it's, it's very much uh, beginning, it begins in the near future, travels back into the past to the very beginning of the family, which is the core of the tree, and then travels back out again through time uh, to the near future again. Why the heck would you structure a book like this, you may ask? Um, well, I, the, the book began as a series of, of ideas for me, for characters. Um, that's always where it begins. I uh, sort of have a sense of a person um, and a few people, and then the, the process of writing the book is kind of a discovery of why I'm interested in them. And in this case, uh, they all belong to the same family. Um, and so, for example, some of the principal characters are um, Jake Greenwood, whose real name is Jacinda, and she's an extremely knowledgeable uh, uh, tree scientist who is uh, working at a resort that is one of the last remaining uh, stands of old growth in, in the world after a... Uh, a phenomenon known as the Great Withering has, has destroyed many of the world's trees. Um, and there's also a carpenter named Liam Greenwood. There's a set of brothers uh, named Everett and Harris Greenwood. Um, and there's an environmental, a hippie environmental activist um, named uh, Willow Greenwood, who uh, was lots of fun to write. And I will say, I, want to mention, I think some of you have read the book, and I know that I've done a lot of events over the past few days, and some of you may have attended of some of these events, and you're gonna hear me tell stories again, uh, and I'm sorry that if I'm like that uncle who keeps coming over every Christmas telling the same stories, thinking you're gonna laugh again, uh, but that's what I'm gonna do, so. Um, and one interesting thing about Willow Greenwood is the, the, the she, she lives in a Westphalia van um, uh, with her young son, uh, Liam, and they travel around the Pacific Northwest, and uh, Willow is so fervent in her environmental beliefs, uh, this is during the 70s, that she sabotages logging equipment uh, by pouring sugar into gas tanks of these machines to, to, to incapacitate them. And so she was lots of fun to write, and I did a lot of research around the early environmental movement, both in Canada and in the US. Um, and you know, the, one of the major comments that I get back with respect to Willow is, um, I love the book, but I have one problem. Uh, and I say, what is it? And, they say, and people say, no Westphalia would ever last for 30 years. <laughs> and I gotta say, I've heard that most here. Um, so, you folks know your Westphalias, I guess, I'm not sure. Um, and, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a big book, it's a big story, but I really paid close attention to the craft of writing it and to, 
generating enough narrative momentum to draw the reader through. Um, and you know, there are secrets that are revealed throughout the story. Some of them are never revealed. Um, and you know, I, I hope that, uh, that my attention to that uh, justifies the 500 pages. You know, when you submit a book this long to your editor, you gotta be able to justify it. <laughs> because they're heavy and expensive to ship, apparently. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about my personal life uh, in sort of the inspiration uh, behind uh, the writing of Greenwood. I'm going to read a bit of a, an abbreviated version of the essay that I published um, in, the, in this anthology regarding uh, how I came to live on Galliano Island, which is where I live with my family, and sort of the process of building uh, our house out of the wood that was right standing on the property when we, when we got there. So I'm gonna delve into that now. Um, hope you enjoy it. And the essay is called Into the Trees. No matter what culture we inhabit, Trees invade our dreams and entwine with our legends and our children's fables. They were our first cathedrals, our first monuments, and for most of us, our first homes. In literature, they've symbolized life, time, nature, death, and rebirth, and their very shape reaches beyond the iconic. It is mythic. And perhaps because of our long-standing intimacy with trees, they are the easiest natural phenomenon for modern, modern people to romanticize. I've been guilty of this romanticization myself. Years ago, while living in urban Vancouver, I used to regularly escape to the surrounding forested mountains to hike, run, or simply perform what the Japanese called shirin-yoku, shinrin-yoku, or forest bathing. Always before my time in the trees had ended, my mood was improved. And quite often, the solution to some problem I was facing, whether creative or personal, had dropped into my head like an acorn into a bucket. And surely, it was this arboreal fascination that sealed my decision to finally retreat from the buzzing crush of Vancouver, that shining city of utter unaffordability, Really, <laughs> it's worse now. <laughs> and along with my wife and two young sons moved to Galliano Island, a skinny sandstone spine of sky-high Douglas fir and western red cedar that rises just a 50-minute ferry ride from Vancouver's coast. Traditionally inhabited by the Penelicut people, the island was logged extensively in the 20s, though a good deal of old growth remains and today is home to a thousand people year round, a number that includes my in-laws. My wife was raised there. Her name, however coincidentally to the subject of this essay, is Cedar. After her back to the land parents came in the 80s to build themselves a little home and live cheek to cheek with nature, sorry, with nature, my wife and I imagined, managed to acquire a small plot of forested land. Not old growth, but thick with towering green giants and a creek trickling across a mossy forest floor. Our plan was to construct a modest cabin, and perhaps foolishly, we decided to build it ourselves. Given that my wife was still nursing our youngest son at the time, a major share of the labor would fall upon me. Let's be clear about something. I am by no means a brawny pioneer. I'm a fiction writer, a somewhat weak one at that. And yes, I've worked a few construction jobs to pay for writing school, but I was grossly lacking the skills as well as the physical stamina to perform such a task. But something about the idea of constructing my own dwelling had long intoxicated me, as did the urge to flee the urban constrictions of the old for the promise of the bucolic new life in the trees. Regardless of these questions, it was already too late because the land was ours. We'd visited it before, but arriving as owners, the trees loomed larger, a hundred feet tall at least, 
Some of the bigger firs boasted five-foot diameters. We walked around the property and selected our house site, marking trees with pumpkin orange spray paint to indicate those we'd bring down. I wanted to build a house out of trees, not get crushed trying to cut them down. So we hired a pair of tree fallers named Gordy and Gord. It's a very Canadian moment. To clear the land and mill the logs into useful lumber. Watching them prepare to drop the first Douglas fir, I sweated with anticipation. To think that a single person with a Husqvarna chainsaw can lay one of these majestic spires to the ground, all on account of my own decision, a decision that my wife and I were somehow legally allowed to make, still boggles my mind. My tree-hugging conscience nearly stopped them before they made their first cut. But we needed a house for our kids, and we needed wood to build it. When the pair left for the day, I inspected their work, my jaw dangling open. It's nearly impossible to describe the scent of a fresh-cut stump of a 500-year-old cedar. Maybe sun-dried laundry, floor polish, the nape of a baby's neck, all mingled with a whiff of grapefruit comes close. The next day, more wooden behemoths dropped with spine-rattling thuds, and the loggers bucked them into segments, then dragged those into a pile beside their little mill. After a week, the cutting was done, and I stood mutely while they narrowed the logs into boards, slicing these awe-inspiring trees and their ancient souls to ribbons with only a little machine they towed behind their truck. As they worked, I stacked the wood to dry, and after throwing around fresh-cut cedar all day, my hands were stained orange with wood tannins. While I was going to do the majority of the work, I admitted that my skills would prove insufficient for the proper framing of a house all by myself, so I hired a carpenter to work with me, a guy we'll call Bob. <laughs> Bob was well over 60, with a silvered handlebar mustache and lots of Grim Reaper tattoos. <laughs> there were rumors Bob had been a biker before retiring to a quiet existence on the island, but he never spoke of it. We'd listen to classic, classic rock, and he'd deflect my many nervous attempts at conversation, and it took me a good month to shut up. Despite his age, Bob was tireless and uncomplaining. The best of what I know about carpentry was learned by watching Bob methodically work his way through complex problems. For lunch, he'd eat three hard-boiled eggs with the shell on that he'd dapple with hot sauce before shoving into his mouth whole. <laughs> That's true. I once saw him accidentally touch the spinning blade of a table saw. He drew his hand back and calmly declared, whoops. <laughs> While I swooned in horror, he casually examined his leathery finger. It was unmarked. <laughs> Together, we erected the forms that would shape the cabin's concrete foundation which Bob and I poured ourselves with wheelbarrows. The 20 pounds that I'd accrued while writing my first novel had slipped silently from my body. Each evening, I'd return to the place my family was staying, too powdered with concrete to go inside. I'd strip and leave my clothes hanging at the door. After mechanically shoveling some food into my mouth, I'd sleep to a depth that can only be described as hibernatory. In the morning, my pants would be stiff with concrete, and I'd have to stomp on them before I could put them back on. <laughs> While I worked, my family settled into life on the island, with its gossip and its colorful cast of characters, draft dodgers, retired tech magnates, weekending rich Vancouverites, dreadlocked hippies, reclusive writers, unspeakably pretentious landscape artists, pot growers, gun toters, kombucha brewers, angry salmon fishers, and LSD-scorched conspiracy theorists. Whew. 
Islands are by their very nature isolating. And while isolation can induce madness, see The Shining, <laughs> it can also cultivate creativity, see Emily Dickinson. There are few comforts on Galliano, no cinema, no public pool, few restaurants. In short, if you want sushi, you'd better roll it yourself. If you want a concert, you have to give one. But with an internet connection and a great independent bookstore, my preferred cultural fixes were easily sated. And for this recluse at heart, it is paradise. The island is a paradox of resource exploitation and preservation, of creativity and madness, of natural beauty and stifling isolation. And for some, this isolation can indeed be disastrous. We met another couple who'd recently moved from Toronto who split up and fled the island just three months later. We turned on each other, the distraught husband told me on the ferry when I ran into him. <laughs> My wife and I vowed privately not to emulate them. <laughs> Though secretly, we feared that the trees and the isolation had the same plan for us, that they would eventually grow between us. Fast forward eight months to the day our house is finished, to the point that my family can safely inhabit it. It's Bob's last day, I can't afford to pay him any longer. And after working together daily for four months, I'm still hoping for some kind of conversational breakthrough, maybe even some emotion. But he simply packs up his tools and says, I hope you like the place. <laughs> and leaves with no fanfare. I try not to be hurt, but I am. I'd imagined, I'd imagined us as great lifelong friends, which included him telling me all about his sordid details of his checkered past, which I'd write about, preserving his identity, of course. But alas, it was not to be. Laying sleepless that first night on our cabin's unfinished plywood floor, I worried that all my work had been in vain. More in service of a romantic ideal, our little family in the trees, than the real thing. Will we thrive here, I asked myself, or will the novelty wear off like it had for that couple from Toronto? People may build structures, I realized then, but we live in ideas. They're all we really have. And despite my worries, it felt truly good to be here in this little house. Whether it was romanticism or not, I'd touched every board, every window, I knew that place better than I know myself. And even though this notion is certainly a fiction that I've invented, I draw deep satisfaction from it nonetheless. We've lived in our cabin for much of the year ever since. And as you might expect, it was a comforting refuge during the COVID pandemic. I've since hung up my carpentry belt and returned wholeheartedly to writing. My latest novel, Greenwood, is a sprawling story of four generations of a particular tree-obsessed family, comprised of a timber tycoon, a tree-hugging hippie, a carpenter, and a guide to an exclusive arboreal resort. I'm writing another novel now about the community on a remote forested island that faces a tragedy. It doesn't look like I'm done with the trees quite yet. After my writing is finished for the day, I often take our sons for long walks in the forest. Already they can discern fir from cedar from hemlock. And at times I worry that they'll grow up isolated, skittish of the city, fearful of others, easy prey for conspiracy theories like so many of the hippie kids who were raised here. That somehow the trees will obscure their ability to see out into the distances of the world. But you can't be in two places at once and I'd rather them here than anywhere else. My wife and I have grown closer, not further apart. For us, isolation has inspired more creativity than madness. And for that, I'm grateful. Lately, I've realized that because they outlive us, trees allow us to think beyond the minuscule scope of our lives. They are our betters, our ancients, our gods. With their rings, they are like living stories themselves. And because of that, they allow us to better tell our own. In fact, 
They're watching me through the windows as I write this now. Trees that will still be alive when my cabin rots into the ground and this paper has turned to dust. I take comfort in that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I think that that essay kind of gets at a little bit of what I was thinking about as I was um, writing this book, and that is the tree being such a beautiful, majestic creature, but then also needing to use it uh, to build myself a place to live because I was essentially broke. Um, and so, you know, that's, I think, one of the great things that I love about fiction is that it can take a particular topic and examine it from all sides, kind of like a prism. Um, and that's what I hope that, that Greenwood does. Um, there are a number of characters who, um, uh, readers have trouble with, like they're complex characters, I will call them. Uh, someone like Harris Greenwood, who is a timber tycoon um, who amasses great wealth, cutting down uh, millions of acres of trees in Canada and in the US uh, throughout the 30s. Um, and I don't wanna give anything away here, but he's got a secret. Um, and uh, it's, you know, He's a character who's very divisive in the sense that he makes decisions for particular reasons, um, but those reasons, uh, you know, may not be the best. Um, so, uh, another character who is forced with this kind of dual dilemma is Willow Greenwood, the the, the woman I mentioned, who is uh, an activist and who believes very, very strongly in uh, the preservation of this incredible gift. Um, uh, particularly uh, on the north, uh, the Pacific Northwest coast of uh, the old growth Douglas firs, the old growth cedars. Um, certainly this is a battle that's being fought today in British Columbia with the Ferry Creek blockades that are going on up there that I've been following very closely. So she's a person who is very ideologically aligned with me, um, but yet she's forced to make some pretty difficult decisions um, with respect to that ideology. Um, and, and, and she creates a childhood for her son that is maybe uh, less than ideal. So, you know, I think when you, when you go to write an environmental novel, uh, which this is, I didn't know it early on, um, and it's been called cli-fi. I don't know if you've heard this term, it's new. Uh, I've said this before, but there's a guy who believes he's invented this term. I think he lives in Maryland. Uh, and he emails me maybe once a week. Uh, every time I say the word cli-fi, he emails me in an interview or something. And he says, thanks for mentioning my term. <laughs> I don't know. Pretty soon he's going to ask for royalties. I'm not sure. I don't even know if I can say it right now. I'm living in fear, but he, uh, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting term, I think, because it, it denotes this new realm of science fiction that is con concerned with environmental degradation um, and is concerned with the kind of end game of climate change as we, as we are seeing it now. Um, and I will say that I've, this book is very difficult to um, categorize. So, uh, I, I have a, a publicist who's a, a great friend, but she has told me over drinks that she kind of hates me um, because pitching this book is very difficult. Um, it's historical fiction, it's cli-fi, it goes into the past, into the future, it's an environmental novel, it's all of these things at the same time, um, which uh, delights me. Uh, <laughs> as I don't care for categories, uh, but yeah. So, um, but I, you know, I'm, and I'm often asked um, about the kind of environmental message and the reason that the future section is set in 2038, uh, four, eight, 34, 38, thank you, <laughs> um, is that I wanted it to be close. I didn't want there to be a buffer time, like 100 years 
you know, um, between now and this great calamity because, um, you know, I'm, unfortunately the signs of the great withering are already upon us. Um, on Galliano Island, the property we live on, uh, the western red cedars, many of the western red cedars that we have around our house are browning and dying now uh, due to repeated drought stress. And, you know, to see a gigantic tree uh, give up is, is, a, is an emotionally devastating experience for, for us. And um, I think, you know, I wish that the Great Withering required more um, imagination than it did. Um, I'm gonna tell you a story about me getting the date of my book wrong. Uh, I was contacted recently by a professor at the University of British Columbia who said, I'm doing a, a course and I'm doing your novel in the course. Uh, and I said, great. And she said, you know, I, and I created this multiple choice test uh, for first year students, one of those ones you fill out and then like a machine grades it. And she said, I thought you should take it and, you know, And I said, do you know how long it's been since I've been in school? And even when I was in school, it didn't go well. Um, and so, and I said, okay, let's, let's do it. Uh, and so she sent me the test and, and I got my wife to, to time me. You know, we wanted to be very strict about the, the process. Um, and so I did it, I, I emailed it back to her and she got back to me in about an hour and said, well, uh, <laughs> you know, and it was questions like, where was this character born? And what, you know, what year is this take place, this thing you wrote? And so um, she said, well, I've got some good news and some bad news. And I said, what? Okay, well, hit me with the good news. She said, you got a 72. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, what's the bad news? And she said, you got a 72. <laughs> um, so forgive me and my uh, lapsing brain. It's an interesting thing to create 500 pages of invented details and then be expected to remember them all. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I don't know what can I else, what else can I tell you i i mean it's it's the book has been compared to the overstory i don't know if you've you've read the overstory of course you have it's a wonderful wonderful book um, uh, but I will say that this this novel is much more focused on the human beings in in the story and is much more concerned with the family. Um, and the, the family saga is a, is a genre that I've long uh, loved. You know those books with the family tree and the start, with all the names and the little diagram. And I, I wanted to take a shot at one of those. Um, but I knew that I also don't believe in those family trees in the sense that they create a very simplistic view of a family and there's one man's name at the top and it just sort of trickles down to all the pe people who are beneath him uh, and it's a very patriarchal uh, formation. And, and so I really wanted to write a book about a family tree uh, but also to really question the idea of what makes a family. Um, and really push back against that idea um, and to suggest that families are much more built than they are born. Um, and this is something that I see in my you know, friends who've adopted. I see in my friends who have found families uh, among people uh, they have no relation to. And so I really wanted to capture that and I kind of update the idea of what constitutes a family. Um, and much of that was inspired by the new research that is being done um, worldwide, but was pioneered uh, by an incredible scientist at University of British Columbia named Suzanne Samard, 
I'm not sure if you've heard of her, but she has essentially discovered that trees talk to one another. <laughs> Uh, that they send chemicals out into the air and through their roots um, to warn each other, uh, to uh, signal uh, uh, that one of them is being cut down, um, uh, to signal periods of drought. Um, she has discovered the fact that when a mature Douglas fir dies, it will actually push its chemical weapons and its resources out into the ground for the trees around it to absorb, um, which I just found so incredibly moving and beautiful. And um, so I think it, it, much of the book was you know, born from the idea that if this tree is the metaphor that we've been using for a family for so long, and our understanding of the tree is changing, maybe we should update our understanding of a family and, and maybe that a family is much more like a forest or a collection of individuals who are helping one another and benefiting uh, one another. So that's, that I think boils the book down into its, into its essence. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna do one more uh, reading from near the end of the book. Um, it's a little chapter. I tried to keep the chapters short in this book because to keep the pages turning, to be honest. Five, I have friends who are still reading it. They update me, I'm on page 220. I'm like, it's been out for two years. I mean, um, and this is told uh, in the person of, of Liam Greenwood. Um, and he is a carpenter. Um, he's living in the year 2008. Uh, what else can I tell you about him? He grew up in a Westphalia van. He uh, has addiction issues. I should also say that addiction is very much a theme that runs through the Greenwood family. Um, questions of inheritance, questions of intergenerational trauma. Um, and so he does very expensive renovations uh, of, of luxury homes um, on the, the east coast in uh, the US in Darien, Connecticut area. And he takes old wood, reclaimed wood, and, and, and gives it new life and, and, and makes his living that way. And I found that as a beautiful metaphor um, for, for much of what's going on in the book. So. Liam Greenwood is hurt, he's fallen while he's working, he's alone, um, he's fallen on his phone, and he has no way to get help. Um, and so he's kind of considering his life and his mistakes and uh, his past. And so this is told in his voice. And the chapter is called Clear. Wood is time captured, a map, a cellular memory, a record. This is why Liam believes carpenters like himself will never go out of business. Because people will always keep wood close in our houses and on our floors, ceilings and walls. In our trusted canes and our finest musical instruments in our heirloom tables and old rocking chairs, and most tellingly, in the very capsules that ease our journey into the ground. When carpenters call a piece of wood clear, they mean it is free of knots and wanes and blemishes. And during his many years of fussing over wood, cutting it to exact lengths and lovingly fitting it together just right, all before buffing it to a soul-warming shine, Liam Greenwood has often thought that people like clear wood best because they need to see time stacked together. Years pressed against years, all orderly and clean, free from obstruction, or blemish, the way our own lives never are. 
Thank you. So, I mean, you know, it's, uh, I, sh I, I should tell you also that I, you know, during the writing of the book, uh, and just prior to and during the writing of the book, which took five years uh, to write of full-time, uh, intense research and writing uh, to accomplish a book like this, during that, fi during that time, I uh, lost both of my parents uh, to cancer uh, very quickly and had two children. Uh, kind of all in that in those blurry years, and um, I was saying earlier today that I think you know we 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 live forwards, but we understand backwards, if that makes sense. And you know, after writing this novel and and living with it as a thing for for a little while, I've really come to understand just how personal of a book it was for me um, to write. And you know, I I was really thinking a lot about. Um, you know, questions of inheritance, questions of intergenerational relationships and misunderstandings, um, uh, you know, questions of, of family. Um, and, you know, I became very attuned to my own place in this intergenerational chain. Uh, you know, it's a very uh, strange thing to lose uh, your parents uh, and I have an older brother, and you know we got together and just realized that the stories that we have uh, are all that we have. You know that there would be no more stories told. We are now the top of that tree. Um, and you know, there, as those of you who've read the book, there are a number of um, sacrifices, a number of stories, a number of dramatic incidents that go kind of unregistered by the book. They go, they're registered by the reader. I'm referring to Everett here, for those of you who have read it. Um, and, uh, you know, I've been asked many times why those sacrifices go unremarked and why those instances, you know, aren't kind of celebrated. And, you know, I, I really believe that, you know, when you have kids and you're up at four in the morning and you're changing a diaper or someone has barfed or, you know, someone just can't sleep, uh, you realize somebody did this for me <laughs> and they didn't get a parade, you know? And uh, it really puts into perspective these sacrifices that, that people make and that go unsung. Um, and so, you know, much, I think, looking back, much of the inspiration for the novel came from from what I was going through, from the grief, uh, but also the joy of watching two new people uh, uh, sort of find their way into the world and, and watching them grow. So, um, yeah, that, uh, that, that uh, though I didn't understand it at the time, um, that, that is the book's genesis. I'm gonna tell one more joke. Uh, <laughs> I, I was talking to my son uh, before I came uh, down from Canada and uh, he's eight years old and he's very inquisitive and very funny and you know, he was wondering, he was like, well, why are you going? Why are you going down there? Uh, and I said, well, I'm going to, to Whatcom Reads. I've gotta go, it's a big deal. And uh, I said, he's, what are you gonna do? And I said, well, I'm gonna give some talks. I'm gonna speak to people, I guess you could, I'm gonna lecture, I'm gonna do some lectures. And he said, uh, you're gonna do lectures? And I said, yeah, and he said, what did they do? <laughs> um, and I said, well, they didn't really do anything. It's not one of those lectures, it's not like a lecture I give you. which, you know, I do admittedly often. Um, it's more of a talk. I'm going to talk. Um, so, yeah, I guess I, 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 much, I much prefer uh, 
fielding questions, and I know that there are a lot of questions out there. And so in the, in the, in the spirit of my son, uh, you've done nothing wrong. I just don't want to lecture you anymore. I want to leave lots of time for questions. Christina? Thank you, Michael. One quick note. He mentioned Suzanne Simard and her work on the interconnectedness of trees. For those of you who love TED Talks, please seek it out. It is remarkable, and you will never think of trees the same way after you watch that video. Please do. Suzanne Simard, Interconnectedness of Trees. And she has a book called The Mother Tree that just came out. Yes. That's incredible. Michael, thank you so much for this. This has been incredible. Let's have one more round of applause, at least for now. Thank you so much. We have time for some questions. And I would ask that those who are interested in asking a question to go, there's a microphone on each aisle here, halfway up. To make your way to the microphone, please. But when you do speak into the microphone, to please mask up. And I will be the directing if, if Michael needs any, any assistance or if we need to help, I will be happy to assist. So yes, we'll have some lights. And anyone who has questions for Michael, please make your way to the microphone. I see you now. There you are. Yes. It's nice to see you, Bellingham. <laughs> Whatcom County, I should say. Yes. So, Michael, I went to one of your talks the other night and was reminded that before you were an accomplished author, you were an accomplished skateboarder. <laughs> and as a librarian, I feel like we're super cool that we found a cool skateboarder to come speak to us in Whatcom <laughs> County. Um, so, and, and just for folks who don't know, like sponsored skateboarder, traveling around the world and interviewed in Thrasher Magazine. I mean, this is a real deal over here. <laughs> so I'm just curious, what if anything uh, you took from skateboarding into your writing and also what your path was from skateboarder to worker with the homeless to writing? Thank you, that's the first time that anyone's ever clapped for me as a skateboarder, so. <laughs> Normally it's like, get out of here, you know. Uh, but yeah, that, I mean, I, I grew up in Thunder Bay, Ontario, which you don't know where it is. Maybe you do, okay. <laughs> Sorry if you've been there. Uh, it's just north of Duluth. It's colder than Duluth. Uh, and, uh, you know, kind of the worst place in the world to be a skateboarder. It's sort of like <laughs> living in the Arctic and wanting to play beach volleyball or something like that. Um, and I got really into skateboarding. It just completely enamored me. I loved the art, the music, the freedom. Uh, and I uh, made a videotape for anyone. Uh, <laughs> anyone my age remembers these relics known as videotapes. Made one of those, sent it away. And I got sponsored by a skateboard company in uh, San Francisco. And I moved there when I was 18. Uh, to the mission in San Francisco and lived there for some years and did that and some of my actually some of my first writing was published in skateboard magazines um, and I really you know it was a really critical part of my kind of creative development because um, I came from a place where I didn't know anybody who wrote a book I'd, I'd always read I'd always loved literature but I didn't even think that that was possible to as something you could do so uh, skateboarding convinced me of that and uh, convinced me that I could do it. Um, and so I uh, returned to Vancouver and did a bunch of other dumb stuff and then uh, went to work at a homeless shelter in Vancouver's poorest neighborhood for uh, eight years. And that was an incredibly transformative experience. I met so many people um, who were who'd been through unimaginable hardship and had, had lived and uh, had survived. And I, I think much of the humanity, I guess, of my work or that sort of respect for human resilience uh, comes from my time spent there uh, and living and, and working with those folks. So um, 
It's been an unusual journey, I guess, here to this podium. <laughs> it's a long and winding road, but it, 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 I think I've always been a person who's been a kind of obsessive and, and, and really just following my interests, and, and that's how I got here. We'll go right here. Hi, Michael. Um, the island in the book is obviously one of the main characters, and I was wondering if there was a real island in Canada that was the inspiration for that, that island besides Galliano. Yeah, I mean, it's, I called it Greenwood Island uh, in the book um, for fear of my community turning against me. Um, <laughs> But, you know, it's certainly one of those Gulf Islands, if you, there's, there's folks who have mapped it out, I think they've judged the sh ship journey that Harris takes. <laughs> people, get, people get serious about this stuff and have placed it somewhere around Cortez Island, I think, which is one of the inner uh, islands, and that sounds about right uh, to me. So it's a, it's a fictional island. Um, but one that is very, very much inspired by uh, the island I live on. And I'm doing it again. I'm writing another island book right now, so um, I may get run off the island yet. Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, having read the book, these generations just bleed into each other so beautifully and the characters bleed into each other. And I'm wondering in the author's experience of bringing this story together, was there a character or a generation that came to you first that you started with that really, really crystallized and then you built from there? That's a great question. Yeah, I mean, it, that's where my writing always starts is with character and with it's kind of a vision of a person. I get a feel for a person, and then I, the process is often just discovering who they are. And um, very early on, I had ideas for uh, Jacinda Greenwood. I had ideas for Everett. I had ideas uh, for Willow and Liam as well. But I didn't know how they fit, fit together. Um, and that interconnectedness of the generations that you spoke about, uh, you know, was what, you know, was yielded through all that writing and editing and, and revising. Um, and, you know, it wasn't until I really discovered that metaphor of the tree and the narrative rings of the tree that I really, you know, the story came together and, and everyone started to hang together as a, as a family. Um, but it's, I, I, had a, I had this kind of a, a, a dreamlike perception of Everett early on that was a story you know, his story is also one that's taken from fairy tales. I mean, it, the huntsman finds or brings Snow White out to the woods to kill her and, and doesn't. And, um, you know, there's a lot of resonance there with Everett as well. Yes. Hi. So first I want to say that, um, that your story made me think about trees differently. I'll never think about them in the same way again. Um, so that was that really resonated with me. Um, but my two favorite characters in the book were Everett and Harris. And I, um, I loved reading about them when they were kids and just how they ended up being in the town that they were in. And they were like these just rambunctious, like feral boys and um, how they grew up there and how the town sort of took care of them. And you know the woman sort of took care of them, but they were really kind of on their own. And I was curious if, um, like, where your inspiration for those two boys came from. Great question. And yeah, that <clears throat> particular section is told with this first-person uh, plural voice, a we voice. So it's sort of the voice of the town. Who they're these two boys who are involved in a train accident, and they just kind of lump them together and make them a make them brothers and half take care of them. Uh, and you know that, that it really resulted the Harris Everett relationship, though I didn't know it at the time. Uh, really uh, was inspired by my own relationship um, with my older brother, uh, who is a banking executive. <laughs> I still, I still just cracks me up. Uh, <laughs> he lives in Toronto. He's uh, 
up there at a major Canadian bank, and uh, he was like a tennis champion. Uh, he, <laughs> he was like a ranked tennis player, very different than me. And so, um, you know, and we had a very difficult uh, childhood and a very kind of uh, hands-off, uh, troubled childhood. And um, I think not knowing it at the time, but I think, you know, we both dealt with it in very different ways, and yet we both survived it. Um, and looking back, I th you know, I'm really, especially since our, our parents are gone, him and I are very, very close now, uh, which we weren't throughout our, our, our teen years and, and our early 20s, and he's, we've really drawn together, and, and, and I think, you know, his response to the the accident to the train accident uh, was to just be as successful as possible and get as far away as he could. And, and, and mine was a little bit different, um, but we, we really have come together and, uh, and it's been a great thing. So yeah, it's, it's, I, my brother and I are pretty close to Everett and Harris. And I, after I wrote the book, I sent him a copy early on, although it was already going to press and there was no way that he could call it off. <laughs> and, uh, and I sort of phoned him, I was like, hi, ah, you know, so how do you like it? And he's a fairly conservative guy. I was concerned about, you know, how he would take it and, and he, he loved it. And so I think it was a, it, that was a great moment. Yes. Well, I was very interested in the uh the opium addicted uh, enforcer character. Yep. I've forgotten his name now. Lomax. And I just wondered, um, partly, um, you know, how he came to be, and what's his significance, you know, uh, with re relative to all the other characters in the story. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, he's another divisive character. You know, some people really don't care for Harvey Lomax, but. Uh, and he could be turned, you know, he's pretty, he is the antagonist of the 1934 section, but I really, it was very important to me to humanize him um, and to not have him be a kind of, uh, you know, just a villain, a, st a stock villain. Um, and I'm really, I think I'm, I'm really proud of, there's a kind of mirroring that's going on with Lomax and with Everett, where Lomax uh, begins with a family around him in a home, um, and throughout the course of the narrative, loses everything um, to his addiction. And Everett Greenwood begins with nothing. And throughout the course of the story, gains uh, meaning and gains a kind of family. And so um, I really found that beautiful, that kind of inverse relationship. Um, and I, I will say that we're working on a TV uh, version of, of Greenwood, like a limited series. And I've, I've partnered with a really great producer uh, who's, who used to work for HBO and who's done some great stuff in the past. And there's much discussion of who should play Harvey Lomax. <laughs> so if you have any suggestions. Yes. Hi, so I'm a part of Christina's class at Western, and part of the thing that we're doing is we're actually mapping all the places that come up in um, Greenwood, and I was wondering if there's a particular place that like stood out the most to you, like you had the most connection to when writing the book. I mean, it's interesting. I have a friend who's a pr professor in Halifax who teaches Canadian literature, and he, he bugs me all the time. And he said, "You were trying to get universities all across the country to buy this book." <laughs> He's like, "It's it's regional everywhere." <laughs> um, on account of the train journey that takes place in the novel, there's a, he travels all the way from New Brunswick, which is where Christina is from, all the way to uh, the West Coast, very edge of the West Coast. And so, um, yeah, my favorite, I mean, I think those scenes in Saskatchewan, in Estevan, Saskatchewan, with Temple and her farm uh, were very meaningful to me. It's a place that I visited, actually, while I was writing it, and uh, looked into the archives of the town um, and so that's one. Greenwood Island would be another one. Um, you know, uh, so, but 
it, I also should say that the Great Depression was a huge part of the, of the writing of this book and the research related to the Great Depression. And it's a little known fact that the Great Depression actually struck Canada much worse than it did even the US, which it struck very hard. And so uh, it was really exciting for me to kind of pay homage to the literature of that era, thinking about Grapes of Wrath here, obviously, and to kind of contribute to that to that literature. And, and, and writing about Saskatchewan in particular was, was part of that, because that was our Dust Bowl. Yes. Michael, thank you so much for uh, sharing your words with us first and your thank erudition, you. your wit, and your banter. They're lovely and delightful. <laughs> I'm just listening to your personal story. I'm really curious how you navigate what seems to be a dichotomy between the Edenic and the paradise of your home and the hellish landscape of the city. Um, do you see those as connected in any way? And are you familiar with literature that's like post-humanist, transhumanist, that tries to say, you know, that this is all natural, for we're natural, and everything we make this room is an outpouring and outgrowth of the human? I'm curious if you navigate that or think about that, and just shoot me your thoughts. I, yeah, I mean, post-human, for sure. Yeah, I uh, <laughs> think about this stuff all the time. Um, <laughs> No, but you, you bring up a really good point, though, like that, you know, there is this tension, I think, between the urban and the natural or the rural in this book. Um, you know, there are scenes in cities, and then there are scenes in extremely remote, wooded locations. Um, and it's something that I'm really noticing in this new novel that I'm writing, um, which is about a very remote island um, where that, uh, you know, a, a tragedy strikes the small community, a 16-year-old uh, woman goes missing, and um, it kind of digs up all of this history. I'm big on the history. And uh, of the island, you know, there are draft dodgers there. There are um, people who are, like Bob, don't want to be found. <laughs> um, and so it kind of conjures the, the, the darkness of, of, a, of a small place like that. And I'm dealing with all kinds of themes like, you know, um, the, the constructed space versus the natural space. And I think you're right to point out that there isn't much difference, and I think that we ought to be blending the two together much better. I mean, I see a lot of trees planted in, in, in Bellingham, and I think that's a wonderful thing, and I think we need to continue to uh, unify those spaces. Mm -hmm. I think we're moving over to this side. Yes. Hey there, thanks for sharing. Thank I you. I love the book. I'm also in Christina's class. I'm also Canadian from Vancouver, East Van. Okay. Kids grew up skateboarding, they probably know you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> My question is, um, how did you, it, when I was reading the book, I, I felt very in tune with a lot of the history, kind of like hidden history that I didn't know that was kind of like hidden in the back of my mind. So I'm just curious on how you went about finding all your research for the book, if you already knew it, or how you went about finding all the history, basically. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I, <clears throat> I, there was a lot of research involved, obviously, if you're going to write about 1908, you need to know what you're talking about, as well as 1934, 1974. And so I kind of treated it almost as like a method actor uh, and I wrote each period discreetly. So I, when I was doing 1974, I, I, I did my research, I did my interviews, I interviewed many environmental activists uh, up and down the coast, and uh, I did, re you know, I was listening to music of the time, I was watching films, I just really immersed myself in that period and wrote the section and then would move on and kind of, and my wife would bug me, you know, where are you now, like, where are you living? <laughs> You know, call me when you get back. Uh, <laughs> Thank you so much. So, uh, and I have a, a little writing cabin on, on our property. It's 10 by 10, tiny little thing. And, and that's where I wrote the majority of this book. And I, you know, had all kinds of stuff of the time up on the walls, um, as long as these really, as well as these really complex narrative structure diagrams that uh, my wife always joked that, like, she was like, if, if a psychiatrist ever came in here, you'd be in trouble because this does not look good. There's strings, there's, you know, pictures. Uh, Thank you again. Yeah, so I, I kind of turned the cabin into a, into a time capsule when I was in those, those, those moments as well. Thank you. 
Thank you. Yes. Hi, I just really want to compliment you on all of the, I felt like showered with metaphors, like temple. Her name is Temple, and she <laughs> creates this temple for hobos. And then yep. the viola that he created, like metaphor, and then so much, and then the, sh the sugar, for me it was like, maybe this is stretching my metaphors, but he had no sweetness in his life. He had a destitute, so he was like trying to find sweetness from these trees. Just metaphor arama. So, compliment. <laughs> but here's my plot point question, not to sound like I'm in an MFA program, but um, I got confused about Liam's death. Oh, it's another metaphor because his trunk broke, you know. Um, but the, like the Red Bull, and then how did he really die? And then is that too much of a spoiler question? What do you think? Anyone who hasn't read it, cover yours. Um, okay. I mean, he, I think there, there's a bunch of time passing implicitly in his last chapters, I will say. That's, that's how it happens for him. Uh, probably dehydration kind of situation. Um, uh, yeah, but you're right about the metaphors, and you're right about um, Temple. I mean, I will say uh, Temple's library was a particularly uh, important aspect of the book to me. I mean, I um, am a huge library user, grew up going to the library as a place of refuge, but also as a, you know, a place of discovery and a place of wonder. Um, and I will say that I, at the homeless shelter that I worked at, uh, we had a library that I managed uh, poorly, um, but I, you know, would get old books and donated books and, and put them all in there, and I was always just so fascinated by the books that people picked. Uh, a lot of Temple's observations come from my observations on which books circulated. Um, and, you know, I, I, I saw it as such, I think the book is also a lot about sustenance in, in its many forms. I think there's a lot of concern around food. Uh, there's a lot of, cons but there's also concern around emotional sustenance and as well as uh, intellectual sustenance and the way that trees give us all of those things. They give us books and apples and maple syrup and why we don't worship them every day for it, I don't know. We have time for two more questions. So we'll go over. Yes. Hello, thank you for your book. Thank you. Thank you for being here. In the 90s, I was working up in Bellingham with some people and we were doing some, trying to do some community education around clear cutting. And I learned at that time that there was this practice where, I think it's Japan, was buying a lot of our timber and sinking it in their harbors to store it for later. And this was the 90s. Is that what you mean by sleepers? Yes, yeah, yeah. And I think I that's mean, a practice people don't know about. Yeah. Can you tell and, us and, about that? And logs last incredibly long uh, as well. Even floating in the ocean, they can they last for years. People still on the island uh, uh, will pull old logs off the, off the beach and, and mill them into wood and you look at it and it's you know, been in the ocean for uh, decades and it looks amazing still. So I think it's the, the incredible, particularly of cedar, it's, it's a staying power in terms of its rot resistance is, is amazing, so. And our final question for the evening. Yeah, <clears throat> you were talking earlier, you were talking earlier about um, that you kind of focused on one era at a time, you know, you wrote them discreetly. Yep. And I wondered about that with regard to uh, the sections with Willow and Everett together. You know, did you write the earlier stuff with Everett first and then uh, incorporate him into Willow's story or did it kind of, how, how did that work out? Um, just given the structure of this book, it's, it's a great gift, but also a great curse in the sense that you meet Jake Greenwood and then you don't see her for 480 pages, <laughs> which introduces many challenges as a writer. Um, uh, and, and I will say that, you know, it's the kind of book that after 
you've read the second half, it throws the first half into a very different light. And I've heard from many people who have gone back and read, reread at least the first half or the whole thing and said that their second reading experience uh, was very different. Um, and I, I love that. I mean, I, I'm a... I'm a rereader myself, so I, I think you know that when it, when a book can do that, I, I'm always uh, for it. But <clears throat> no, I did. I wrote particularly for what Everett does. I'm just not going to spoil anything. But uh, I had no idea what he was going to do with the baby until the moment he did what he did with the baby. And I wrote into it just blind. Um, and I'd already written him getting out of jail um, before that. Uh, and it was just one of those wonderful kind of intuitive moments where the solution to a problem that I'd created <laughs> in rare moments uh, arrived uh, on, my, on my desk. So that was a good day. But uh, yeah, but much of the writing was done out of order and chronological order and much of the editing involved all kinds of fixing the various time periods to make sure that they uh, uh, agreed with one another. Um, for example, Harris Greenwood when he burns down half of the island's forest happened later in the writing process so I had to go back and adjust the island in every other section kind of like a bad time travel movie where they have to <laughs> save Times continuity or whatever they're doing, I don't know. It was like that, but less dramatic. This has been an amazing conversation tonight. Thank you so much, Michael, and to you. Thank you. If you want to hear more, there's one more chance to catch Michael tomorrow. But this one is online, so you do need to register if you know anyone else who is perhaps interested in hearing Michael speak. And it is tomorrow at 11, so if you're interested, all you need to do is go on to the walkandreads.org website to register. And so since we're coming to the end, not only of this evening, but also of this year's Walk and Reads, we know that there's some big announcement. <laughs> right? And it's customary for Walk and Reads to allow <laughs> the featured author to announce the upcoming book for Wacom Read. So, what shall 2023 Wacom Read's book be, Michael? You have the honors of presenting this wonderful news. Next year's title <laughs> takes us back in time to Spokane in the early 1900s during the free speech fights between the industrial workers of the world and local police. It features a colorful cast of characters, including down and out brothers, Rye and Gig Dolan, vaudeville singer, Ursula the Great, fiery union instigator, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, and a scheming and brutal mine owner. This novel won the Washington State Book Award for Fiction in 2021, was a Washington Post top book for 2020, and was on Oprah's list of best books of the year. I love this book. I've read it. I am pleased to announce that the 2023 Whatcom Reads title will be The Cold Millions by Jess Walter. He's great, it's gonna be great. And the Whatcom Writes prompt will be between fact and fiction. Let's give Michael Christie another warm round of applause for tonight's wonderful conversation.